good morning, Dr. Ochoa. Great, we're gonna get going in just a second. I know we've got um, classrooms full of students joining us from around the state. So thank everybody for tuning in. And we appreciate you guys making time this morning and hope everybody is well and safe today. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us here today. I know we're gonna be having a bit more trickle in to the room as we start our conversation today with Dr. Ellen Ochoa. I wanted to thank everybody for taking time out of their morning and we are in for a great treat. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our speaker today. She um, is doing a program later on this evening but made some special time to have a conversation with our students here this morning. So I hope everybody came with some great questions to engage with our amazing speaker here today. Dr. Ochoa is a veteran astronaut and was the 11th director of the Johnson Space Center. She was the Space Center's first Hispanic director and its second female director. Her previous management roles include deputy director, excuse me, deputy center director and director of flight crew operations. Ochoa joined NASA in 1988 as a research engineer to, um, as a research engineer at Ames Research Center and moved to Johnson Space Center in 1990 when she was selected as an astronaut. She became the first Hispanic woman to go to space when she served on the nine-day STS-56 mission aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery in 1993. As she flown, as she as she flown in space four times, including STS-66, 96, and 110, logging nearly 1,000 hours in orbit. Born in California, Ochoa earned a bachelor's degree in physics from San Diego State University and a master's degree and doctoral degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University. It's my honor and pleasure to turn the mic over to Dr. Ochoa for our conversation this morning. Thanks for being here this morning. You're welcome, uh, and thank you. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about my background and my career at NASA. And uh, there's a lot going on in human spaceflight today, particularly if you're watching the news, and in fact, in, in space exploration in general, um, and in other areas that use science, technology, engineering, or math, what we call the STEM fields. So uh, my first message to you is we need you. We need your curiosity, your creativity, hard work, uh, your intellect, you know, to uh, help make new discoveries in the future or help solve challenges facing our communities and our planet. So uh, something to think about and I, I look forward to your questions later. You know, I can really say that uh, my family's focus on education was really the key to my career in space exploration. Um, my dad's parents were from Mexico um, they emigrated um, after they were married and had a few uh, kids, um, first to Arizona and then to California, where my dad was born. He was the youngest of 12. And uh, he was actually able to attend college tuition free by getting an appointment to the Naval Academy. Uh, my mom had grown up in Oklahoma until she was uh, a teenager, and then she also moved to Southern California. And uh, she didn't have the opportunity to go to college when she was younger, um, but she was always interested in learning. And um, after we moved to San Diego when I was a year old and uh, a suburb of San Diego, and that's really where I grew up, um, the whole time she was raising uh, my four brothers and sisters and me, uh, she would take like one college class uh, every semester from our local university, San Diego State University. So um, I just, you know, she was always talking about her classes and that was just something we grew up hearing about, uh, uh, about her college classes and what she was interested in learning. And I think that definitely made a big impression on, on me and on my brothers and sisters. And we, we all did end up going to college and uh, all of us but one, in fact, went to our local university, San Diego State, which at that time, uh, actually uh, was enough supported by the state that uh, didn't actually charge tuition, uh, which was a big help for, for all of us. 
Um, it did have fees, uh, you know, health fees, parking fees, books, uh, a number of other things. And I was able to get a, a small scholarship from the school to actually cover those as well. And I just lived at home when I went off to college. Um, so was able to go, you know, pretty inexpensively at that time. I didn't actually know, uh, you know, what direction I was headed uh, when I went off to college. I just was uh, somewhat convinced that more uh, education was going to be important for my future. Um, the things I had concentrated on in high school, uh, I was in music, um, in the concert band, marching band, orchestra. So I thought about music, um, thought maybe business would be interesting. Uh, I'd always liked my literal literature classes and I'd always liked my math classes. So I took a little bit more of all of that uh, when I went off to college. And it, it was really through my math classes that I got interested in the, the science and engineering part. Uh, I was finishing up the calculus series in college and um, kind of talking to some of the other students and, you know, was learning about why they were taking math and what they were majoring in. Of course, most of them were majoring either in engineering or physics. Uh, and uh, I was really just taking it because I enjoyed math. And so I decided I would try to check out, um, you know, more about these subjects because that might be something I would be interested in. So I actually uh, went to talk to a couple different professors. I talked to one from the electrical engineering department. And uh, unfortunately, um, he was not at all encouraging. He uh, made it pretty clear he didn't want to see me in his department. He talked about, well, we had a woman come through this department once, but, you know, the course of study is really difficult and I'm not sure that it's, you know, something that you'd be interested in. Um, fortunately, uh, when I went to talk to a professor in the physics department, uh, I got quite a different story. Um, he said, hey, I'm really glad to hear that you're interested in physics. He gave me an idea of what careers um, people could have if they majored in physics, which was really important to me because, you know, I didn't know any scientists or engineers and I really couldn't picture um, what it meant uh, to be a physicist. So that was really helpful. And then when he found out I was finishing up the calculus series, he said, well, you know, I think you'd do really well if you started into the physics series um, the, uh, you know, next semester, because you've already learned the language of physics and now you would be able to concentrate on the concepts. And most of the students would be trying to learn them simultaneously. So that talk, along with a uh, weekend conference that I attended that was sponsored by Women in Science and Engineering, where they brought in uh, women who were in a variety of careers, including physicists, was what really led me to uh, change my major to physics. And Nate, with that, maybe it's time for the first trivia question. Wonderful. Um, so everybody, we have a few preloaded trivia questions for you guys to participate in today. Let me load up our first question here. You should be able to see on your screen a question now that says, how long has the ISS been continuously inhabited? Is it five years, 10 years? <laughs> or 20 years. If you want to go ahead and give us your best guess. And I'm assuming people know that ISS is the International Space Station, but I'll just say it just in That's case. Very, <laughs> thank you for the clarification. Okay, we're almost at, we're at a tie now. We've got three for 10 years and three for 20 years. We'll give it one more minute. We've got about four of you yet, but if you have to take a choice. We'll give it 10 more seconds and I will let Dr. Ochoa give you guys the correct answer. All right, we're gonna close it now. Most of you guys thought 10 years was the answer. How did they do? Uh, well, actually uh, uh, about almost half got it right. It, it will be 20 years in just about three or four weeks. Um, so, uh, the first astronauts and cosmonauts got to the International Space Station November 2nd of uh, the year 2000. 
And so uh, for the last 20 years, every single minute we've had people in space. And uh, a lot of times people don't really realize that, but that really does make us a, a spacefaring nation. And it's been uh, amazing to be part of that. And I'll, I'll be talking more about the space station in a little bit. So um, I'm gonna see if I can move this poll out of here. Okay, uh, moving on. So uh, as I was a, a physics major, I did have the chance uh, over a couple of different summers to have some research jobs in laboratories. Um, one of them wasn't even a physics lab, it was a biochemistry lab. And then uh, the next year I got to do a, a physics laboratory. And that got me interested in doing research, You know, thinking about that as a career. And uh, so what I really found out from those experiences was the people who did research and particularly the people who got to sort of pick the research questions or at least sort of determine how they were gonna go about um, understanding more about these particular issues, um, all had graduate degrees, um, at least master's degree and often uh, PhDs. So I decided to go off to graduate school and there was a particular professor I was interested in working with at Stanford University. Um, I had gotten interested in optics and particularly um, using optics to do um, image processing, to, to extract information from images. So, uh, so I went off to graduate school the first year I got my master's degree and near the end of that year, uh, was when the space shuttle flew for the very first time. And it was a very different kind of spacecraft that had ever flown before. And uh, it was capable of many different things, uh, you know, of launching satellites, of capturing um, satellites, bringing them back to Earth or repairing them in space, and of operating as a laboratory in space for the time that shuttles were up. Um, it started out five, six, seven days, and uh, towards the end of the program, uh, most of the flights were 14 or 15 days or so. Um, so, so this was something new, um, you know, really flying a laboratory. And then uh, as I was getting my PhD at Stanford, a couple years after the first shuttle flight is when Sally Ride flew, uh, first American woman in space. And that, that was a huge deal until her class of astronauts was selected. Um, women had been prohibited from being astronauts and there weren't any minority astronauts as well. So this was just at the time that this career as well as many other careers uh, were opening up to women. And then um, a little bit after she flew a couple years later, I think uh, is when the first uh, Hispanic astronaut flew, Franklin Chang Diaz, who had uh, grown up in Costa Rica and then moved to the United States for his uh, higher education. So these things all got me interested in, in space. I mean, I had been interested in space, you know, just in a general way, like many people were, um, but didn't really see a role for myself there until um, I saw people like Sally and Franklin fly. And the fact that they were doing research, uh, which is where I was headed, uh, was really what uh, gave me the impetus to put in my own application. So as soon as I got my PhD, um, I sent in my application, um, but NASA wasn't doing a selection that year. And in any case, uh, I actually really never expected to hear from NASA again, uh, because just so many people apply and, uh, you know, I just didn't know if I would be competitive. So I went off to um, a job as a research staff member at a Department of Energy laboratory. And uh, a couple of years later, I was actually uh, called by NASA to come interview at Johnson Space Center. Um, they were doing a selection that year. So that was the first time I'd ever been uh, at a NASA center, first time I'd ever gotten to talk to an astronaut one-on-one -on -one and learn more about the job. And it, it really made me excited about it. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't selected that year. But uh, I was encouraged to keep my application current uh, for the next time that they would uh, do a selection. And I learned more about what they were looking for. And there was um, clearly one um, aspect of being an astronaut that I didn't really have any experience in. And that was you know, operating in some kind of uh, operational environment where you had to 
you know, take in information, make decisions that could actually even be life and death decisions. So one of the things I did was go off and get a pilot's license. And then I decided I, I wanted to work for NASA, even if I was never selected as an astronaut. I, I just uh, enjoyed that the mission that they were on and the fact that, you know, they were involved in research that was learning about new science and, and exploring more um, about our universe. So I, I took a job as a research staff member at NASA Ames Research Center, which is in the, the Bay Area in California, and then actually became supervisor of a group um, uh, where we had about 35 people that were doing, looking at high performance computing with the idea that someday it might be able to be applied to uh, space missions. Uh, I did keep my application current and three years after my first uh, interview, I was called to interview again. And uh, that was the year that I was selected, 1990. And along with 22 other people, uh, became the uh, 13th class of astronauts. Um, so before I get into my training in flights, uh, Nate, this might be a good time for another trivia question. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, really appreciating hearing your story and how your persistence your next chapter is about to unveil itself. So before we get to that, let's unroll another trivia question. You guys should now see on your screen the question, how long does it take the International Space Station to orbit the Earth? 90 minutes, 20 minutes, or 45 minutes? I'll leave the poll up for 30 seconds. How long does it take the International Space Station to orbit the Earth? 90 minutes, 20 minutes, or 45 minutes? What do you guys think? 10 more seconds. All right. Good participation, guys, 85%. Awesome, let me end this and share the results. And Dr. Choa, how did we do? Well, so the answer is 90 minutes. So every hour and a half, um, the space station orbits the Earth. I actually thought maybe some of the answers would be a lot longer because sometimes people guess that it actually takes several hours, which um, isn't surprising because you're going, you know, 24,000 miles or so. Um, but uh, we do go around every hour and a half. And uh, so just think for a minute about what that means. That means every 45 minutes you see either a sunrise or a sunset and you're going from light to dark. So you really have to think about, um, you know, how you're gonna live in an environment like that. Clearly, we don't go to bed every time it gets dark and then get up when it gets light because we'd be doing that 16 times every 24 hours. So we keep to a normal 24 hour day, um, just like we're used to on earth when we're in space. Um, but for example, when we were in the space shuttle, we would need to put shades um, across the windows when we did go to bed so that the light streaming in the windows every time uh, we had a, a sunrise uh, wouldn't wake us up while we were trying to sleep. Well, and actually, if you don't mind, we have a few questions um, in the chat box that are pretty relevant to where we are in the conversation. Okay. Um, one is, um, how do they keep up with time in space? Yes, yeah, so uh, we use, uh, well, I'll tell you how we did it on the space shuttle and then maybe talk a little bit about how they do it now on the International Space Station. Um, we used a time uh, that we called mission elapsed time on the space shuttle. So essentially time started at zero uh, right at the moment of launch. And then we just counted up from there. And so as we looked on our timeline uh, for the day about all the activities that we needed to do, they were all tagged to a, a, an MET, a mission elapsed time. So it might be a three days, two hours, and 40 minutes you had a, you know, a particular task to do. And so uh, what I would do is wear two watches, and I would start one watch, um, just again, start it right at launch so that um, I could always have on my wrist mission elapsed time. Of course, we had a, a way of uh, looking at that in the shuttle as well. And then um, on my other wrist, I would uh, generally have Houston time because we were always talking to um, mission control in Houston. And uh, you know, if a new um, ship was coming on work, I wanted to be able to say either good morning or good evening or you know, have some idea of what time it was in Houston. 
Great, thanks so much. And thanks for the questions and just some housekeeping for everybody. You can enter questions in the chat box or at the Q&A button at the bottom black ribbon of your screen. And we can either take those questions there um, or in the chat box. But thanks so much for your participation. And I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Ashoa. Thank you. Sure. And I, I sort of realized I didn't answer the second half of that question because they do um, use a different time now on the International Space Station. Of course, they're up there continuously. Like I mentioned, they've been up there uh, uh, with people in space for 20 years. So they actually use Greenwich Mean Time, GMT. Um, and uh, all of their activities are uh, tagged to Greenwich Mean Time. And it's um, obviously a little bit different time that you have in Houston, but remember we also have cosmonauts on board. And so uh, they have a control center in Russia. And we also have uh, astronauts from other countries oftentimes on board. And we have some kind of control centers in Japan, um, in, in Germany and in Canada. And so everybody just uses GMT. So uh, just uh, a few words about training. Um, after I was selected as an astronaut, our, our class of 23 people, which included five women, um, trained together basically for a year. And part of it was a lot like going to school. We had workbooks to read, we had lectures. Um, we had to demonstrate that we um, uh, were understanding and learning about, for example, all of the shuttle systems as well as at least a little bit about a lot of different science um, activities that you know, we might be involved with uh, on the uh, shuttle. And um, then we started into more specific types of training. The pilot astronauts um, started to learn how to fly the shuttle training aircraft, which would uh, train them to land the shuttle at the end of a mission. And the mission specialists like me um, started to learn how to um, operate the robot arm and to do spacewalks and things like that. Um, in the second year of training, we focused a little bit more on those specialized kinds of training and also um, had jobs in the astronaut office that supported the ongoing shuttle program. Um, after I'd been there for two years, I got assigned to my first mission and then really spent close to a year training with my crew, maybe not full-time at first, but certainly the last six months we were training full-time together as a crew. And um, I had a total of four uh, space flights, and the first two were uh, really just focused on, on science research, which is you know, very much what I had been interested in when I first applied. And uh, both of my missions were part of a program that NASA had at the time called Mission to Planet Earth, trying to learn more about our own planet and how the systems work together. And we were specifically focused on the atmosphere and the issues of ozone hole and ozone depletion. And trying to understand more about um, what caused ozone depletion and how much of it might be due to natural variations in the amount of light coming from the sun, what we call the solar cycle, and how much due to human activities. And particularly there were some harmful chemicals that people knew uh, made their way to the upper atmosphere and co contributed to the depletion of ozone, CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons. So we were trying to look for byproducts um, of those chemicals in the atmosphere. And I can remember landing from my first mission. We'd been up for nine days. And um, when I had a chance to talk to one of the scientists who uh, was uh, the principal investigator for one of the instruments that we had on board. And I asked him, well, you know, is there any way that we can, um, you know, improve the, the data that we get for you? And he said, uh, yeah, you can stay up longer. Um, and at that time, NASA was working on a space station and they had already partnered with the European, the Japanese and the Canadian space agencies. And they were in the middle of, of designing it, nothing had been built yet. And um, just about that time, uh, it was decided to uh, bring in Russia as a major partner. And um, so these five space agencies got together and really over the next several years designed and started to build uh, the International Space Station that we know today. And I had a lot of opportunity on the ground to, um, to actually work on this. Um, so these five space agencies represented 15 countries. 
Um, I had a chance to work with members of the Russian Space Agency and their contractors to define how we were going to select crews, how we were going to train them, where we were going to train them, what language, um, and then how we were going to certify that they were ready to go fly. So got to be kind of right in on the very beginning of that. And then I had an opportunity to fly on the shuttle again, my third flight, and it was the very first shuttle to dock with the International Space Station, which was only two pieces um, at that time, about 40 feet long. Nobody was living on board because we didn't have any kind of uh, life support system going yet or a habitation module. And then three years later, I got to go back on my fourth and final mission um, by that time, of course, there were crews living on board. Um, the U.S. laboratory was up there, and they were already involved in science, even though we were continuing to build the station. And um, the job of my crew was to bring up the very first piece uh, of a truss structure, which uh, over several years would be built out to be about 350 feet long, and where we would attach um, three extra solar arrays. We had one solar array at that time that was powering the station. And we needed to bring up laboratories from the um, European Space Agency and from Japan. And we needed more power. And to do that, we needed to build this truss. So a little bit later on, um, I'll be showing you a video of that flight and give you an idea, um, a little bit of what it meant to assemble the space station. Um, but maybe now is a good time for uh, one final trivia question. All right, everybody, this will be our last and final trivia question. So get your fingers ready. Let me see if I can get the question pulled up. Ah, yes. The question is, at what speed is the International Space Station traveling? Option one, 100,000 miles per hour. Option two, 55,250 miles per hour. Option three, 17,500 miles per hour. All <laughs> astronomically fast speeds to be traveling. So we'll give it um, about 10 more seconds for everybody to participate. Take your best guess. This is our last trivia question of the day. Looks like 55,000 is really popular. Let's give it a few more seconds. All right, I will close it and Dr. Ochoa, tell us how we did. Okay. Uh, well, the answer is uh, 17,500 miles per hour. Okay. And um, so, yeah, you know, if you had the opportunity to, to uh, actually do a little bit of multiplication in math, um, that would line up with being able to orbit the Earth in an hour and a half. Um, because, let's see, the radius of the Earth is uh, roughly 4,000 miles. So the diameter, roughly 8,000. Uh, multiply that by pi, which is a little bit over three. So you get, you know, between um, 24,000 miles, 25,000 miles. And so, um, so it takes about an hour and a half to orbit. Um, but that's still pretty, pretty darn fast. That means we're traveling over the Earth, if you look at our ground track, at about five miles a second. Wow. Um, so we crossed the United States in about 10 minutes. So if you're looking for a particular area, you, you know, you've really got to be uh, on your toes, so to speak, um, to be looking out the window at the right time um, to be able to look down and see, you know, maybe your particular city uh, or uh, whatever it is that you might be looking for. And of course, sometimes um, you've been asked to photograph um, particular places over the earth um, to assist scientists in some of the work that they're doing. Um, and so again, didn't have too much opportunity to, um, to do that as you were going by it at five miles a second. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. So let me just talk for a few more minutes and, um, and then show you my video. But I did wanna tell you a little bit about some of the things I did um, after my flying career was over because I had the opportunity to have uh, a number of different management and leadership roles at Johnson Space Center um, after flying. And it culminated in becoming a director of Johnson Space Center. And Johnson Space Center has about 10,000 people working there. Um, a little under 3,000 are actually government employees, civil servants like I was. 
And then the rest uh, uh, work for other companies that NASA contracts with to bring in um, specific skills um, to help us carry out our job. And Johnson Space Center is the home of human spaceflight. So over the rest of the time that I was there, including when I was a director, we, um, we finished the assembly of the International Space Station. And so when I was director, what we were particularly focused on was doing research and really being able to make the astronauts more productive in being able to get more research done for a whole variety of customers. And in the last um, few minutes of the video, after I show my flight, I'm going to show a little bit of clips of what it's like today on the station and uh, give you some examples of some of the research that we're doing. And at the very end of the video, uh, talk a little bit more about what else is going on besides the International Space Station. And uh, while I was there, uh, Nat, uh, Johnson Space Center was given the job of developing a new spacecraft that would go beyond low Earth orbit. It's called the Orion spacecraft. Um, it's had one test flight so far um, and uh, a few years ago. And now, uh, there's another NASA center that's developing a heavy lift rocket um, to uh, launch it into orbit called the Space Launch System or SLS. And Orion and SLS will fly together for the first time. It's planned for next year in 2021. So something to look forward to. And then um, it will fly, uh, that mission will uh, basically test, test those both out and then it will fly with crew for the first time, probably a couple years after that. Um, and will actually go uh, to uh, in orbit around the moon and actually around to the far side of the moon. And then the third flight of them together uh, is planned to actually land people on the moon. And it will actually uh, hook up in uh, with another piece of equipment in a lunar orbit and then actually send a lander down uh, with uh, the first woman to land on the moon and the next uh, astronaut, uh, male astronaut as well. So those are all things that are coming up in the future. And also during the time that I was there in management and leadership positions, we really started working in a different way with commercial companies. Of course, we had always contracted with commercial companies who built our spacecraft um, and who helped us operate them. But NASA would own those spacecraft and we would give them very detailed specifications. Well, we started working with commercial companies um, it, where we just gave them really high level requirements and they could design the vehicle themselves and then actually own it and operate it. Um, and uh, the first um, job for these companies was to deliver, to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. So we've had two companies delivering cargo now for several years, SpaceX using the Dragon vehicle and uh, Northrop Grumman uh, using the Cygnus vehicle. And in fact, um, early yesterday, um, the Cygnus uh, um, actually was uh, grabbed um, by one of the astronauts on board using the robot arm and birthed. Um, it, it had launched uh, the day before that. So uh, a new cargo vehicle had just launched. And now we have uh, two companies who are, are working on delivering astronauts. And you may have seen this summer that SpaceX launched their, their version, their vehicle, Crew Dragon, with two NASA astronauts to the space station for the very first time. Uh, they stayed there a couple of months and then they landed safely back on Earth. And we have another company, Boeing, uh, working on a vehicle as well. So that was a big part of what we were working on when I was center director. And one of my big jobs in, in addition to help make all that happen was making sure that we had, you know, the right workforce, um, attracting and retaining a diverse workforce, making sure that people felt valued and respected and could come in every day and contribute and help us innovate. So it was a, a wonderful job. Uh, and with that, I think now we'll turn to the video. So let me go ahead and um, share my screen with you all. And I'll be narrating this um, as I show it. Okay, so uh, this is of course down at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And uh, this is my crew. We had a crew of seven going up to the International Space Station. 
And of course, we were going to meet a crew of three who were already on board. Here's the space shuttle main engines. They run on liquid fuel that is stored in that big orange tank there. And then the two white rockets on either side are filled with solid fuel. And when all of those uh, light off, that's when you actually leave the launch pad. Uh, I'm the person here in the middle, uh, operating as the flight engineer and assisting the uh, commander and pilot who are there in the front seat um, during the flight, particularly during launch, landing, and rendezvous. So um, we uh, lift off with about 7 million pounds of thrust. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. And the solid rockets burn for about the first two minutes of launch. And uh, they're really the ones that help you uh, get off the ground and get going uh, to a speed fast enough where you're not going to fall back to the earth. And then they separate away, um, fall into the ocean, and they're uh, reused. And then it's the liquid engines that take you the rest of the way into the orbit. And it only takes eight and a half minutes to get us going to that uh, speed that we talked about earlier, 17,500 miles an hour. Then we circularize our orbit. And over the first day and a half or so, uh, what we're doing is getting ourselves in the right orbit and at the right um, orientation to come up to rendezvous with the International Space Station. This is the view the astronauts on the station had of us as we were getting close. And you can see that big piece of equipment in the payload bay, that was the truss piece that I mentioned, we called it S0. And this is a view of what the station looked like where we were kind of coming up to um, dock with it in that big silver ball area. And this is the very final moments of docking where we're um, actually flying up to the station. That's the station in the upper half about to make contact with the docking mechanism on the shuttle. Took us about 10 minutes to pull the two vehicles together and then we spent <laughs> Two hours uh, doing a leak check. That was our commander, Mike Bloomfield. He was happy with his flying. We finally opened the hatches between the two vehicles and met up with the commander of the space station, cosmonaut Yuri Onofranco. And then we moved into the station and met the other two folks who, who happened to be members of my astronaut class. So it was great to see them. And those three had been on orbit for four months. So I think they were happy to see some new faces as well. And we got to work. Uh, one of the jobs that um, we always did was to transfer supplies. You can do that um, by holding them between your knees, not just in your hands when you're floating between vehicles. And then the next morning, we really got to work. Um, I was the robotic arm operator along with Dan Birch, uh, one of the station astronauts. And we used the station arm to pull S0, this truss piece, out of the payload bay. And this is the... Um, the robot arm controller station that we were using um, to operate. And if you can tell, there's, there's no cameras. I mean, there's no windows. So we only have some very limited camera views as we're doing this. And then it's important not to be distracted by that view uh, behind where you can uh, see the Nile River and the Gulf of Aqaba as we're flying over the Middle East there. This is the very final part of the assembly. And uh, that claw on the right is gonna grab around a rod on the left and that's gonna form the very first um, mechanical attachment between the station and this uh, truss structure, S0. And that's Dan and I, uh, he was actually at the controls when we made uh, contact there between the, the two pieces. And then over the next week, um, as the shuttle remain um, docked with the station, uh, we did a series of four spacewalks um, to uh, help finish up the structural uh, attachment and then um, essentially power up all of the equipment. So these views coming up are all taken from the cameras that are on the helmets of the spacewalking crew members. You can see them looking down at their hands. Um, this one is holding a, a cable tray that would actually weigh a couple hundred pounds on Earth, but of course it's it's weightless um, as we're in orbit around the Earth, uh, just like everything else is. And they had to hook up a whole bunch of cables. They had to provide power. They had to provide a way to talk to the equipment through a computer commands and to bring telemetry or information back about all of these equipment. Um, and so a lot of those spacewalks were focused on hooking up those connections. 
Uh, this is just a view of moving one of the spacewalking crew members around from one side of the station to the other, again, using that uh, 60 foot long robot arm. And here's what it looks like inside at the end of a spacewalk as we bring the crew members in. Uh, this is a view inside the shuttle portion. Um, we had brought up a meal to share with uh, the space station astronauts. And then, you know, the next night we would go over to the space station and share dinner with them. Uh, this is my crewmate, Rex Walheim, uh, kind of showing off for his two little boys. He was doing a video conference with them. Another crewmate, Steve Smith, showing what happens when you let liquid loose in the cabin. In microgravity, the surface tension takes over and it forms that sphere. So at the end of the week that we were uh, attached, uh, we had finished all our work. Fortunately, it had all gone well. And uh, so we closed the hatches between the two vehicles and got prepared to undock. And in this case, the pilot, Steve Frick, was gonna be at the commands. Um, and he was gonna uh, use this target to help back away. And our job was to uh, back away about 400 feet and then perform a complete fly around, go, go around the station 360 degrees and take camera views. Uh, you can see sunrise just happened there and uh, take uh, photos, um, uh, very detailed photos to help prepare for future uh, assembly missions. So now here's what we look like as we're backing away. Of course, our payload bay is empty except for the docking mechanism. And this is what the station looked like to us as we got about halfway through this fly around. And we're using cameras here to take photos and a laser ranging device to make sure we're staying about 400 feet away. And this is our final good view that that dark rectangle in the center there is the piece that we had just added to the station. We spent a day checking out all the systems on the shuttle that we would need for re-entry. And now this is the final day, uh, the day we're gonna come home. We're closing the payload bay doors. Uh, we're putting on special suits that we use for launch and landing that can help, uh, help us survive in certain types of emergency situations. And then we're uh, getting in our seats. Uh, we've now come through the atmosphere where parts of the shuttle get heated up to as hot as 2,800 or 2,900 degrees. And now we're over Florida and getting ready to land at the shuttle landing facility. You can see the runway there in the distance and the heads up display shows us we're traveling about 290 knots and we were about 12,000 feet at that point. Um, we may look like an airplane, but we're really a big glider. There's no engines running at all. We're gonna land and uh, we wanna make sure it's at the right spot and at the right speed. And so that's the, that's the tricky part of landing. Um, we, uh, when we get to about 300 feet, we lower the landing gear and uh, prepare to uh, land on the runway there. We're still going um, well over 200 knots when we land. So much, much faster than an airliner. We use this drag chute to help us slow down um, and make a safe landing. Although we have quite a long runway there. It's about three miles long at Kennedy Space Center. And so that was the end of an 11 day mission uh, known as STS-110. Uh, and now what I'd like to show you is just a few minutes of what the space station looks like today, because obviously over the next several years after my flight, we continue to bring up pieces. These are actual views, um, actual videos of the space station in orbit. It's uh, almost a million pounds. You can see how much it grew um, after our flight. And of course, what it is doing is operating as a laboratory. Here's a very fundamental physics experiment, the alpha magnetic spectrometer, trying to learn more about dark matter and dark energy in the universe. This is the US lab, and this just gives you an idea of some of the science equipment um, that we have inside that we can use to do a whole variety of different experiments. Uh, this is astronaut Peggy Whitson, and she's working with um, stem cells here. Um, they started out as skin cells. She turned them into um, stem cells and then became uh, essentially heart muscle cells. And you can see they're actually starting to beat together um, as wood cells on Earth. Uh, this is astronaut Kate Rubens. Um, this was a few years ago. She's actually going to be launching to the station again later this month. 
and she's doing the first um, DNA sequencing uh, in space, uh, again, a few years ago. Astronaut Shell Lindgren is showing you um, a combustion research facility. This is what flames look like in space, quite a bit different than here on Earth. And they actually combust at two different temperatures, one a much lower temperature um, than we're normally used to seeing. And so we can learn a lot about just basic combustion as well as how to um, fight fires or prevent fires in space. Uh, astronaut Scott Kelly is working with the freezer where we keep samples before we have the chance to uh, send them back to Earth. Uh, most of those are for biology and human health experiments. Uh, Joe Acaba is working on a capillary flow, understanding about fluid flow in microgravity. Here's an experiment that a lot of uh, students have been involved with um, across various different universities. They can send up algorithms and have these two different, you know, sort of mini satellites um, do different kinds of um, uh, maneuvers and, and test them out inside the station. This was the first generation of a 3D printer we had on board. I think we're on generation four and maybe the fifth one just launched this week. Uh, which will use ceramics instead of plastics. Of course, there's a lot of monitoring of the earth. There's equipment outside the station um, that's used to understand more about the earth and how it's changing. Uh, we have the opportunity to launch a variety of CubeSats and other types of small satellites with um, sophisticated sensors. And then NASA itself uses the space station to understand more about how they can do long duration um, exploration in the future. Here's an expandable module that we added a few years ago to the station. Uh, and um, uh, it uses technology that was developed at Johnson Space Center and licensed to a company called Bigelow Aerospace. We've also been growing plants for several years. And it's nice to be able to give at least a little bit of fresh food um, to the astronauts uh, on board. And that'll be really important for, for example, a three-year mission to Mars. The astronauts themselves are the subject of a lot of experiments trying to understand more about human health and performance in space. Part of that is keeping up their bone health and muscle health uh, by exercising every day. Uh, I think this is Scott Kelly giving himself a flu shot and he and uh, cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko spent almost a year in space, 340 days, um, trying to understand um, really uh, over that length of time, what are the changes in the human body and how can you make sure uh, people can stay healthy. All the astronauts also participate in educational um, uh, events. Uh, a lot of times there's uh, video conferences with schools um, around the world. And um, uh, in addition to uh, sophisticated sensors, the astronauts also take videos and photos of the Earth. And you can see a lot of those because they get posted on social media, either under the space station account or the NASA astronauts account, or generally each astronaut has their own, you know, either Twitter or Instagram account where they post uh, photos. So it really gives you a good idea of what it looks like. Here's some of those cargo vehicles I mentioned. This is the SpaceX Dragon, and this is the uh, Northrop Grumman Cygnus. Again, uh, one of them was just captured um, early yesterday morning and um, attached to the station. And this is a third vehicle called Dream Chaser by Sierra Nevada that's gonna start flying next year as a cargo vehicle. And finally, we get to the uh, crew vehicles that are in development. This is the one in development by Boeing called Starliner. And we hope to see uh, a test flight um, first without astronauts and then with astronauts next year. And this is the SpaceX Crew Dragon, which had their first successful flight, as I mentioned, this summer. And in fact, they're gonna launch um, again with astronauts to the space station at the end of this month um, on the night of October 30th. So that's something you could look for. And finally, looking at our exploration beyond low Earth orbit, this is a simulation of what the Orion spacecraft launched by the SLS vehicle would look like. And here's the Orion spacecraft itself. As I mentioned, it's going to head into orbit around the moon and allow us to uh, land astronauts uh, on the moon in a few years.
So again, something to watch the development of. So let me uh, get back to uh, speaking with you today. And uh, I think at this point, uh, we can turn it over to Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ochoa. That was phenomenal. Um, if it's okay, could we maybe keep 10 more minutes of your time and wrap around 12.10 to get some Q&A in? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Um, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box for the Q&A. And Cassie, if you're ready, I'll turn it over to you to help with our Q&A. Good morning. So one question that we received is, have you discovered any life forms during your missions? You know, no, uh, we haven't as yet had any opportunity to uh, find life anywhere um, other than on Earth yet. But as you can imagine, that's something that is of interest to everyone. And there are many scientists that do um, spend their careers trying to understand what kind of life you might actually be looking for and where you might find it. And that is one of the reasons that we do focus on Mars, because we do think there was the possibility that life existed there uh, a few million years ago. Um, we have a rover there now, Curiosity. We have another way, one called Perseverance, that's on its way to Mars um, and will land in February. And that's one of the big questions they're asking. Um, people are also looking for Mars on what they call the ocean moons. So there are a few moons around planets and particularly Titan and Enceladus, where they think um, that might be a place that we um, could look for life. And um, you might have just read very recently that there's a, a probe around Venus that has found a, a chemical called phosphine in the atmosphere. And there are physical processes that can lead to the creation of phosphine, but there's also biological processes that can lead to the creation of it. And so the big question now is, you know, where did this phosphine come from and could it have been the result of biological processes? Thank you. And two questions um, in regards to being an astronaut. Um, the first one is, what types of questions do they ask in an astronaut interview and how do you pass the time in space? Well, in an interview, they're partly giving you an opportunity to talk about uh, what you have done in your career, sort of how you've been able to use your education in your career so far, and um, maybe how you've progressed, you know, um, what sorts of um, uh, not only projects have you been involved in, but maybe what roles you've taken in those projects. And as you can imagine, it's important for an astronaut to be both a good team member and a leader. Um, because you have to take on both of those roles as uh, a member of an astronaut crew. So they're interested in hearing about experiences that you have sort of in both of those roles. And of course, um, the majority of the people who are interviewing you, there's a, a committee, um, are astronauts themselves. So as you can imagine, one of the things they're sitting there thinking is, would I want to be cooped up in a small spacecraft for you know, weeks, months, maybe even years nowadays? Uh, with this person. Um, so, uh, you know, part of it is just sort of kind of evaluating, um, you know, your personality and compatibility. Um, and what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. How do you entertain yourself in space? Oh, well, let me talk a little bit about my missions, which were shuttle missions, and they were all short, 9, 10, or 11 days versus you know, today where astronauts spend six months or maybe even closer to a year on orbit. So we didn't have um, hardly any free time, um, as you can imagine um, on a short mission, there was so much that we needed to do. Um, what little time maybe before heading to bed in the evening, of course you would look out the window. I mean, that's, you know, that's the main activity that you want to be able to do. And um, it's always amazing you know, whether you're on the, the daylit side or the night side where you can look either look at, um, you know, uh, city lights or you can look out into space and see, you know, many more stars than you would have the opportunity to see uh, when you're on Earth. And of course, on the daylight side, um, you know, just amazing views, uh, uh, you know, all across the Earth. Uh, one thing I got to do on my first flight, you know, it wasn't really free time, but 
one of the extra activities we were doing was filming a video to be shown to kindergartners through second graders about living and working in space. And uh, so I had the opportunity to take up my flute and, and play it for a few minutes to talk about being able to do hobbies in space. And as I mentioned, you know, to be honest, we really didn't have a lot of free time, but today on the station, people do um, have some free time because they're living up there for so long. And there are instruments on board and they do have the chance to make music. Um, some of them uh, take up art projects. Um, of course, they do, they read, they watch movies together. Usually on Saturday nights is movie night. Um, so a variety of things, kind of, kind of similar to what you would do here on earth, except nothing that would require you to, uh, you know, leave your home. So, so maybe now that we're in the midst of a pandemic and we're not leaving very much, you can imagine a little bit more of what it's like to be on the station for a few months. And you mentioned being able to look out at the lights and Mr. Witt asked, what was your most memorable view from the ISS? Oh, you know, that's, uh, it's always hard to answer that because there's so many memorable ones, but, um, you know, I do remember uh, uh, in that very mission that I showed you the video of, as we were backing away from the station, uh, we got about 400 feet and then we needed to wait about 10 minutes for sunlight to occur for us to do this fly around. And during that time, we were looking down on the earth and we could um, see these amazing aurora um, on the earth, uh, you know, which is just a, a great, um, display of lights. In fact, I might actually even be able to show a, a photo here. Let me see here. Um, so that's what Aurora looked like from space, this amazing green light with, um, you know, red filaments and it's caused by, you know, these particles that get um, shot out from the sun and then they interact with the uh, oxygen in our atmosphere and, and cause these lights uh, close to the poles. So that was just an amazing thing to see from space. It's, it's kind of the most sci-fi looking thing, I think, um, that uh, I had the opportunity to see. That sounds amazing. Miss Allison asked, many of our ladies and underserved students struggle with math. What helped you to achieve? What would you recommend for students struggling who aspire to do uh, careers in STEM? Well, you know, I was just kind of fortunate that math came easy to me. But I will say there are a lot of astronauts for which that isn't the case. They struggled with math too, and I've heard a number of them talk about it. But they were so interested in, you know, science or engineering, being able to understand the world around us or being able to develop um, new technologies or new products, you know, that they, they um, worked really hard at math. And, and what I can just say is, um, you know, especially uh, try to take advantage of, of all the classes that you can get in high school that are math related or science related, which I have to admit, I did not do. I took a lot of the math, did not take the science, kind of had to make that all up in college. Um, but um, often when you're struggling, um, there are other resources that you can turn to. You know, there's a lot of extra things online these days where you can um, look for an extra lesson in the particular subject you might be studying in math, or of course, asking your teachers. Um, in college, I would often go to my professors during their office hours if there was something I didn't understand and have them explain it to me one on one. And I found that they were always willing to do that. You know, I think they were just really happy that students were working hard and, try and trying to learn the subject that they were there to teach. Um, also in college, I will say there, there's other kinds of resources. There's tutors. There's often um, student chapters of societies like um, uh, the Society of Women Engineers or the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. And one of the things these chapters do is um, provide study groups or provide tutors or, you know, a student who's already been through that class will help tutor um, a student in that class. So um, I think one of the things that people sometimes don't realize is that everybody struggles at some time. You know, it may be in a different class than the one you're struggling with, um, but everybody uh, really goes through that at some point. 
And um, so these extra resources are there for your help. You shouldn't feel like, oh, I'm the only one struggling. It can be kind of easy to feel that way um, because you know maybe other people just aren't talking about it. But again, particularly if you can find some of these I think we lost Dr. Ochoa for just a second. Let's let her internet stabilize and we'll, we'll be right back. But I just wanna congratulate everybody for these amazing questions. Thank you so much for sending um, over 13 in. Dr. Ochoa, I think we might have you back now. I'm sorry for the um, little snafu. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, thank you. Okay, perfect, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. All right, I think we have time for just two more questions. And um, one of them is, are you bilingual? And if yes or no, has it ever helped or harmed your career? So uh, unfortunately I am not. And um, really my father did not want to speak Spanish around the house. Um, you know, I think he grew up at a time where uh, people were encouraged just to speak English. And so he, for his kids, he just thought, well, it's important that you speak English. It was interesting, but my mother, who was not Hispanic, was the one that was always trying to encourage him to speak Spanish around the house. Because I think she saw the value of, wow, if you can speak more than one language, I mean, you will have a skill that um, will serve you well your whole life. So I wish I did. I have taken Spanish off and on at various times, but have never really gotten comfortable enough to you know, give talks or, or give interviews, unfortunately. But to me, it would be a huge advantage. It would be a way for me to do outreach to more people um, mm -hmm. and just be able to speak to many more people, not only in the US, but around the world who, who, who speak Spanish. So I think speaking more than one language is a huge benefit. Sure, I had a similar background where my father I was Hispanic and we didn't speak it much at home <laughs> either, so I understand that. Um, I also identify as Hispanic and Latina, however, and this question comes from Washington Junior High and says, what do you feel is your legacy as the first Hispanic female astronaut? Well, you know, after I came back from that first mission, um, I, I just had so many invitations to speak at schools all around the country. And of course, schools with high Hispanic populations, right? And um, so some of the memories that I have from that are almost every school, some little kid would come running up to me and say, you know, my name is Ochoa too. You know, like I'm Carlos Ochoa or I'm Ana Ochoa or, and they were just so excited to see somebody that they could identify with in some way. And you know, that doesn't always matter to everybody, but it certainly made a huge difference to me when I saw Sally Ride fly in space, when I saw Franklin Chang Diaz um, fly in space. And it, it really took me seeing that for I think the whole idea of, well, maybe this is something I could do. Um, I just, it just really had not entered my head before I saw that. So if I had the opportunity to play that role for um, other students, um, you know, e other e people, even in their careers, um, earlier in their career, to me, that's just a huge extra part of being an astronaut, an uh, extra rewarding part of my job. And, and even if people aren't interested in being an astronaut, it's just that idea of, hey, here's somebody who never grew up thinking this was something they could do. Um, but they worked hard, they followed in the footsteps of other people and they were to achieve it. I'm going to set a high goal for myself too, maybe in a completely different area. Um, but um, if, if I can give people that inspiration, to me, that's just um, so rewarding. Great, thank you. Well, I will hand it back over to Nate. Okay. Great. Thanks, Cassie, and thanks, Dr. Ochoa, for all of those really inspiring answers. Um, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, if anybody wanted to actually ask a verbal question, I'm able to unmute um, anybody who raises their hand to ask any questions um, with a microphone. So if anybody has any last questions, um, please do feel free to raise your hand. 
And Nate, there was one thing I forgot to mention, which is you can see the International Space Station flying overhead. And um, you can just uh, search online for Spot the Station. It's a NASA website, and you just put your uh, city in. And there's a very good one in Arkansas on Thursday night, hmm. 7.38 p.m. So as long as it's not completely cloudy, um, you should be able to see it, and the website will tell you, you know, where to look for it. So I hope people will, will take that um, awesome. uh, as an action and, and look for the space station. Thank you. That's really great. We'll actually email that around to everybody as well um, to, to remind you to spot the station. <laughs> um, we've got two hands raised. We'll give this a try. April Blackburn, I'm going to unmute you and see if we can give you the, the mic. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so I'm here. At, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So I'm here at Watts Elementary with my uh, sixth grade gifted and talented class. And we have so many questions. They are so curious and they've loved this. Um, so the first one is asking her about um, what the food was like. I guess they're describing it as paste that she would eat while she was up in space. Like what did she eat up there that she was not so crazy about or enjoyed? And then can things get wet? up in the space station? Because we saw the water bubble. We're just kind of yeah. curious about that. OK, sure. Well, I'll talk a little bit about the food. We, we actually have quite a variety of food, and even more now than, than when I was flying. Um, for a lot of astronauts, be, um, they somewhat uh, have sort of a diminished sense of taste. In other words, things don't taste quite as vivid, maybe, in space. Um, and usually it's because the fluid in your lower body sort of migrates into your um, upper body and head. And it's a little bit like you have a cold. And so if you know that sensation of not being able to taste as well when you have a cold, that's what it's like for a lot of astronauts. But I will have to say, I never had that issue. I thought things tasted exactly the same in space as they did on Earth. And um, the food that we bring up, a lot of it's freeze dried. So we add water to it. And if it needs to be heated, we can heat it up as well. Um, we bring up a lot of tortillas. Um, we use that instead of bread. Um, because as you can imagine, bread makes crumbs. And you don't want crumbs like you know just floating all around the cabin. You could actually inhale it or get one in your eye. So you don't want to eat anything that causes crumbs. So we would use uh, tortillas, um, you know, we'd bring up like a chicken salad, sometimes peanut butter. Um, we even made space s'mores with um, a chocolate bar, peanut butter and marshmallows and wrapping it all up in a tortilla and heating it up. And then um, the question about do things get wet? Yes, absolutely, they can get wet. Um, you saw that water ball um, that was floating in the middle of the cabin. If it actually floated over and made contact with anything, people, but the, the concerning thing would be equipment, it would actually sort of latch onto the equipment and then could make it wet. And obviously for some of the equipment, that would be a, a really bad idea, just like when you have um, electronic equipment at home. So. Uh, even though we did let it go in the middle of the cabin, what you didn't see is immediately after that, we all put straws in the middle and we just drunk it down um, so that it wouldn't um, mess up any of the uh, equipment. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, April, for asking those questions. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time here today and just wanted to thank you, Dr. Ochoa, for taking the time. This has been just so inspiring and I know our students have taken so much from this and um, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And students, I hope you took as much from this as I did and hope that every single one of you reaches for the stars, literally <laughs> and figuratively. Um, do you have any last words, Dr. Ochoa? And then we can um, close our workshop out. Just wanna thank everybody for tuning in today. And uh, just like I said at the very beginning of when I talked, um, hope you'll think about uh, careers that involve some kind of science or technology or engineering. Um, they're exciting. Uh, they can help you make new discoveries and solve challenges. And um, we, ne we need your great minds. So, so give it some thought. Thank you again. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.